Welcome back to another episode of History in Your Own Backyard. I'm your host, Susie Selleck. Today, we're in Cincinnati, Ohio, at the Cincinnati Union Terminal. I'm joined by Cody Hefner. Cody, thanks for having us. Thanks for being here, Susie. So, Cody, when was this legendary structure first built? So Union Terminal was built between 1929 and 1933, and it actually finished ahead of schedule. They are about nine months ahead of schedule, which is incredible to think of today with construction projects. Normally, they go long, and to think that during the Great Depression, uh, with technology of the 1920s and 1930s for them to be able to finish nine months ahead of schedule and ahead of budget is pretty incredible. Oh, that's you're right. Oh, wait, did you just say ahead of budget? Yeah, too? under budget. So how much did this original structure cost? Originally, it was $41 million. In today's money, that's over $585 million. And that was all private funding, too. There was no, it was not a uh, public works project or any part of the New Deal during the Great Depression. This was all private funding. Unbelievable. Now, you said earlier that sometimes you're like, oh, I, I was here when it was restored. Um, talk, can you talk to us a little bit about that, too? Yeah, so it, opening in 1933, it had never undergone any sort of full-scale restoration or serious maintenance. There was maintenance throughout um, just for general upkeep, but it was a lot of Band-Aids. And so you think of eight decades of water damage as it seeps through the exterior masonry. Uh, that crack freezes in the winter. It expands, and so now it's a bigger crack come spring, and so on and so on and so on. And it starts to take its toll on the building. So it was in serious need of repairs. So from 2016 to 2018, it underwent a $228 million restoration. So we just said that it was $41 million to build it originally in the 1930s, $228 million in the 2010s to restore it. Cody, where uh, where did the name Union come from? So Union Terminal was built by seven different railroad companies. And so you have the union of these seven uh, different railroads because up to that point there were actually travel magazines that talked about traveling in different cities and when it came to Cincinnati it more or less said don't avoid Cincinnati if you can because you would have to get off one train line go all the way across town with all your luggage all your uh, your chests and your trunks and things like that to another train line and this is not just the early 1900s where you have taxis or streetcars. This is in the 1800s as well, where you're in wagons and muddy roads and you're sloshing around to try to go from point A to point B. Think of the airport. Every time you get off a plane, you're running to your connecting flight. And you think that's bad enough just to go within one large building. Now you're going all the way across town. So they figured this is ridiculous. It's untenable. We're going to start to lose um, industry and business because people aren't going to, want to come here. So they got together and decided to build Union Terminal and here we are. Cody, how many people could Union Terminal hold just on an average day? The way it was originally designed, it could facilitate 17,000 passengers a day, including 216 trains, which is 108 outbound and 108 inbound. Now, it never really hit that peak aside from one period, and that was during World War II. In World War II, it actually exceeded that. Uh, it was the Union Terminal's location of the first USO Troops in Transit Lounge. Otherwise, the USOs were at YMCA's or churches, so you would have to leave the station to go there uh, for cookies and donuts and kind of the comforts of home as you're passing through the country. They decided, why make them leave? Why not have them um, do that right here within the station? And during the course of World War II, three million service members passed through Union Terminal, which is roughly one-fifth of all U.S. GIs who served in the war. So an incredible amount of traffic through the building, peaking in June of 1945 as the troops start to come back from Europe and start to come back from war. Amazing. Uh, this may be a silly question. Is it still, are there anything with the rails that are still in use and service today? So behind Union Terminal is CSX's third largest um, hub in the country. So it is still very active. In terms of passenger rails, there's one Amtrak line that comes in and it, it doesn't get a lot of traffic and it comes in the middle of the night. So it comes about 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. wherever it, it you know, as it's passing between Chicago and New York and DC, 
that's just where it hits. It hits about 1 a.m. And, and 3 a.m., depending on if it's going east or west. There has been a lot of talk about increasing rail travel, and it's just not gone very far. But the infrastructure is still there. The building's still here. Uh, so it's still functional. There are rail lines out back. So it could happen in the future. Uh, but right now, we just have the one Amtrak line. Now, there's an interesting feature um, here, the rotunda. How high is that? The rotunda is 106 feet from the concourse floor to the ceiling. Uh, Union Terminal itself is the largest half dome in the Western Hemisphere. Now in the world you have the, uh, the Sydney Opera House in Australia, obviously, but in the Western Hemisphere it's Union Terminal and it is massive. So there are some really beautiful uh, images around here on the walls, that these mosaics, what do they represent? What's really impressive about Union Terminal is the public art display that's in here and the mosaics are the, the shining stars of that. Uh, these are glass tile mosaics, each one about the size of a nickel or even a dime, plastered up there on these walls. And so on the north wall, you essentially have uh, the history of Cincinnati starting from the right and going all the way to the left. You have the pioneers, the people who are first exploring this territory, um, to the settlers here, to the dock workers and the river workers, and finally the industrial area of the 1930s. Um, on the south wall, you have the history of the United States, essentially, and you have buffalo roaming the, the wild plains, you have Native Americans, and then you go to, again, the pioneers, the railroad workers as they're laying railroad lines, um, all the way up to the, uh, the steel workers in the city. So it's not only... Uh, the people, it's different modes of transportation that you see in the backgrounds. There's essentially three layers to these mosaics, and so you have the people in the foreground, you have transportation um, in the background, and in between you sort of have as the landscape changes from these wild plains to cabins to small villages to the big city. And what's really interesting is they're frozen in time. So you have zeppelins, you have airplanes in these mosaics, and that's the height of technology in the 1930s when yeah. this opened. And people come in and they think they don't know the history of the building. They just think, oh, wow, this is just a large building that looks like it's probably from the 1930s. And so the decorations, you know, are in line with that. And they think, oh, that's why it stops where it is. But that is the pinnacle at that point. And so it's really a snapshot in time. And the artist was really uh, meticulous in his work. He actually took photographs of all of the individuals in the mosaics and then painted them, shipped it off to a company in New York who then made the tile mosaic out of it. And the baby that's in one of the mosaics is still alive. Um, he's in his 80s and he comes in every now and then to, to check out his baby photos in here in the rotunda. <laughs> That is an awesome story. That's that's really cool. Now, Control Tower A, can you talk to us about that? I, I admit, I don't know what that is, so we tell us about that? It's exactly what it sounds like. It is the control tower for the station. So up there you have essentially a 180 degree view of the train yard. It's really stunning to see how expansive the train yard is. People look at Union Terminal and they say, wow, that's an incredible building. And it is, it's 500,000 square feet. Yeah but uh, it extended another 450 feet off the back of the building that was demolished in the 1970s, and you have all the rail line infrastructure out back that is still used today. CSX is still very active, but this is where the station managers would uh, control the tracks. And so you knew, is this line in use? Is this line opened? Where to, to send trains as they came into the train yard? And you can still see the control board back there. Uh, it still lights up, and you can, it's a good visual to see just how many train lines there are back there and what that infrastructure looks like. Cody, how long has the ice cream parlor been here? The ice cream parlor has been here since at least 1990. The space itself has been here the entire history of Union Terminal. And it's, a, again, everything in Union Terminal is a work of art in itself. Um, now it's sort of this uh, microcosm of Art Deco design, but even when it was built, it was designed to be beautiful. And so the ice cream parlor is filled with Rookwood tile, which is highly sought after. It's very beautiful. Um, and it's you know now 87 years old, so it's showing some of that wear and tear. But originally it was the Rookwood tea room, and it was just that. It was a tea room where people could come in, they could have their afternoon tea, 
that never really took off. Uh, it wasn't, it didn't get the full use that they expected. So um, during World War II, that was where the USO Lounge was. And it even had kind of a patio area out into the rotunda where you would have troops sitting there with their feet up on, on a chair, reading the newspaper, or kind of relaxing as they wait for their next train. Uh, and now it's an ice cream parlor. It still has all the same designs and decorations inside. Um, it's largely not changed that much, but now you have families in there eating ice cream. Uh, it's sort of the reward at the end of the day. Like, all right, if you, if you leave the museum, currently they're closing. If you leave the museum, we'll go get ice cream. And it's sort of that, um, that treat to get kids to get ready to go home. Yeah, all right. Um, there's another really cool feature here that I personally have gotten to experience. My college sweetheart um, once stood on one side of this building and I on the other. And it was the first time he said, I love you. And I could hear him all the way across the, but it was interesting. Tell us about the, whis is the whispering wall, right? The whispering fountains. The yeah, whispering fountains. So in the corners, you, you have a fountain in each corner. And then you have this big arch between them. And the sound travels along that arch to the other side. And it's interesting because you stand here, you're in the middle of the rotunda, and you look up and you say, yep, I can imagine that voice traveling up and over. But it actually sounds like it comes up out of the drain of the fountain. Yes. And it's, it's just the, the play on, on the architecture. And it's not just those corners, though. You can stand in one corner of the rotunda and stand in the opposite corner, not just by the fountains, and you can hear that same effect. It's interesting because if you walk into the building early in the morning um, or late at night and there's other people in the rotunda speaking, it sounds like they're right next to you and they could be all the way across uh, across the building from you. It's, it's sort of eerie, but it's a lot of fun. And inevitably you have families come in and you have mom or dad or grandma or grandpa send the kids over to one corner and they just take off running. and a lot it's funny because it's not just the kids who go running the adults go running too because they're so excited and what's really unique about union terminal and you see that in those moments for example is that it's a generational um it's this generational gift that keeps getting passed down and so you have parents and grandparents who relive their own childhood their own moments here in the building with their kids now and the Whispering Fountains is a big key to that. Yes, yeah, it's it's a really neat feature. I mean, I wonder if that was something that was on purpose when it was getting built. I think it. I think it was just a happy accident. You okay. hear you hear that uh, a similar story in other buildings. For example, the U.S. Congress. Uh, there there are these stories that groups of senators would stand in one spot because they could hear the opposing party developing their plans in another spot. Uh, and some of that's made up, but you still, again, have the rotunda. You have the, the curves that let that sound echo in, in such a way. But, um, yeah, it's just a fun, happy accident of the building. And there's a lot of those. There's a lot of hidden features. There's fossils in the walls, which now the building houses a museum of natural history and science that has dinosaur fossils. So it's, it's almost like we planned it that way. But it's just a happy accident because fossils are in the ground, they're in the stone, marbles the stone, and you have these beautifully preserved fossils right here in the columns of the walls. The building's filled with these incredible details. Okay. Uh, in the Scripps Howard Newsreel Theater, for example, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a newsreel theater. So uh, travelers coming through, they're not looking at TVs as you are in the airport. They're going into the newsreel and they're learning news of the day. They're what's uh, what's the latest news in, in World War II, what was the score of the World Series, things like that. Underneath the chairs, there's hat racks, you know, for, for men's fedoras that you could just slide right in there, and they're still in there. In the dining rooms that are just off the rotunda, mm -hmm. the Los Anaville dining room was originally a lunch, lunch counter, and it had the serpentine lunch counter. That counter's gone, but we've mimicked where it was in the floor with new terrazzo because when we did the restoration you could actually see the concrete where they poured to fill that because you have to remember there's this period where a building's not historic it's just old for a while and okay. so like all right how do we make this usable for this current moment and they get rid of a lot of these really fantastic details that was one of them but we brought it back in that way and there's also this beautiful carved linoleum right off of the dining rooms and you think 
you think linoleum, you think of your kitchen floor from the 80s yes. or whatever. Yes. It is exactly that. And it's got the same kind of crinkles and cracks in the in the sealant on the surface. But the designs are so rich and so incredible. Um, they're really well preserved. And the same artist who did those those murals did a ceiling mural in one of the other dining rooms that is sort of a street map of Cincinnati. But it's funny because they have it flipped. It's in reverse for some reason. So Kentucky's on the northern side and Cincinnati's on the southern side. But you can see where the rivers intersect. You can see where Union Terminal is. And the street grid sort of matches as well. Um, so when you come into Union Terminal, you need to look down, you need to look up, you need to look left and right. It is a full 360 degree experience here. A lot of people ask, when was the heyday of Union Terminal? Was it in the 1940s? Was it during World War II? And the answer is always, it's today. Yes, yes. Never and, and yes. in its history has it been used so consistently by so many people in such a way as it is today. So it's, we're, we're really living history right now. Yeah, well, and Cincinnati is well served because of that. So Cody, I so appreciate your time and being able to be here with us today and share this great history of Union Terminal. And thank you so very much. Thanks for coming in, we appreciate it. Thank you for watching another episode of History in Your Own Backyard. I'm your host, Susie Selleck, here today in Cincinnati at Union Terminal, joined by Cody Hefner. Cody, thanks again for having us here. Thanks for stopping by. We appreciate it. And remember, travel, travel slowly, slowly and, and stop, stop often. often. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.